All right, I've hit the button this time, so uh, no, no bullshit. Okay, good. All right. Three, two, one. <laughs> Joe's Movie Clubcast presents Schlock Talk, where we watch hot ass trash so you don't have to. My name is Joey, and I'm joined by. Uh, it's Carl again. Yes, my good friend Carl, and tonight we are talking about um, a movie that's pretty personal to Mr. Uh, Mr. Carl himself. We are talking about Stephen King's The Night Flyer, a 1997 straight to HBO movie. So, Carl, how did uh, how did you come across this movie back in the day? I had HBO, and I saw it, and I thought the name sounded cool. Yes, but back before HBO was an app. Yeah, this is <laughs> um, back in ninety seven or ninety eight. I'm just a you know fourteen years old. Or 13 years old, it was 97, I guess. Uh, and yeah, I thought the name sounded cool, so I'm like, well, I'll watch this. And I still think the name sounds cool. That's why I use it as my internet. That's why it's been my internet handle for 20 plus years. Yeah, the name is really cool. And yes, that is part of the reason that I picked this movie to be on this episode, um, the third episode here of uh, Schlock Talk, is because it has been Carl's handle for a long time. Um, and I got it for your birthday this year or Christmas last year. They kind of run together because they're pretty close. Yeah, um, one of those dates. Yeah. So I think it is a little interesting since I mentioned that, you know, back before HBO was an app, this is actually a movie that debuted on HBO and then went to theaters. So it kind of reminds me of now seeing stuff on HBO Max and in the theater at the same time. You know, obviously a little bit different. Um, but yeah, it went to HBO, the channel first, and HBO released it on home video. Um, and then it released in a theater um, in 1990, uh, in early 98, after coming out um, in the second half of the year on HBO. So this movie, um, I got a couple of uh, different places where I've got some information on it. So on Wikipedia, it was funded by some European investors, and Paramount was going to pick it up, but they were going to shelf it until Halloween of 2008, and that didn't meet with what the investors um, were promised by the director and the producer, so they decided to put it on HBO. Um, when it did hit box office, according to Wikipedia, it made about $125,000. Um, I was looking to see if it was available to be streamed anywhere. I came across some other stuff. so. On this place called couchpop.com which I'm not familiar with um, it said it did cost them about a million dollars to make and they only made about ninety one and a half thousand dollars at the box office so either way ninety one and a half hundred and twenty five thousand that's that's not very much money I mean a million dollars is pretty cheap as well but I mean this is a this is a made-for-tv movie so actually I think for what we have um watched so far this is the biggest budget by quite a lot yeah, I think so. Um, so, 
that being said, <clears throat> let's just jump right into this. Um, so, the, the premise here um, is you have a dude in an airplane flying around landing at these kind of podunk airstrips and killing people. And uh, a newspaper, and tabloid. a tabloid newspaper, yes, um, called the Inside View, uh, decides to pick it up and start following this story because it's so sensational. And that's yeah, that's I mean that's pretty much the movie. Um, of course, the main it, it goes to the main or the main reporter turns it down because it's not crazy enough or cool enough or whatever vampires are a dime a dozen yada 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 so they give it to the young new girl they just hired and then you know the killer strikes again he steals it back um so at this point we've only seen like one kill and we've seen a bunch of office stuff um did you notice anything when they were doing the the opening scene or the first, the opening scene in the first airstrip or anything that uh, stood out to you or anything you wanted to talk about? No, not, not really. It's probably going to be a trend with this movie. There wasn't really a whole lot to talk about. It was just I, I following mean, a reporter around the whole movie. Yeah, and, you know, there were some, some things here and there. Like, obviously, he's this kind of, like, jaded jaded guy he, i mean the, the thing i thought was the funniest was you know he's working for this thing called the inside view so he's working for a tabloid so you know think national Enquirer, or you know whatever else is at the checkout lanes at the grocery store and he thinks he's like the hottest shit like he thinks he's writing for fucking new york times or the times or la times or, you know something that's actual viable um i mean he treats people like shit he broke numerous laws, you know, just to get his story, to get his information. He didn't really care. Um, yeah, basically, he's just a real scumbag. Yeah, he's a real scumbag. The, the actor did do a good job. He he did a good job in that role. Um, and I guess, you know, he was kind of the opposite of um, the young the young reporter who they kept calling Jimmy, as in Jimmy Olsen, I guess because of how, how wholesome and ready to do just whatever. Um... He even tricks her, locks her in a closet once he's got, you know, the big break after she helps him. It just, uh, you don't really see a lot of kills. You, 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 you saw the first one and you see a dude get his face slashed and you kind of see some aftermaths. You don't really see a ton else. Um, even, even in the big, like, climax in Wilmington, there's really not they don't really show you much like you said it's just him yeah. it's just you know him in a plane talking basically talking out his ideas so he can write them down as headlines you know trying to make stuff sensational um you know he even starts calling him the night flyer um you know him going around talking to people like i said impersonating officers you know whatever he needed to do to get the information um yeah it just there was unlike Lamageddon or you know schlock where you had an animal running around doing things that were while dumb and not good cinematically it was at least funny or <clears throat> was so Something bad i mean to talk about at least yeah you're going to you're going to remember the laser beam eyes from Lamageddon or the dude um replicating 2001 a space odyssey while in a gorilla suit outside of a store like yeah <laughs> there's I think really the most memorable thing is <clears throat> I think the coolest thing was the the photograph book you found in the plane and then when we finally get to see Dwight Renfield aka the Night Flyer um I mean he looked real shitty because this was like 1990s makeup and effects and you know low budget at that um, although I guess, you know, a million dollars 28 years ago, 24 years ago, math is hard, um, was a lot more than it would be now, but... It still wasn't very much. No, it still wasn't very much. So, um, 
the thing that was interesting about the photograph is, you know, it kind of, you, you got to see a little bit about where the guy came from. You could deduce that he had been a pilot and that's why he was flying now. And it would have been a good setup if the uh, failed sequel had actually got off the ground um, that would have given you backstory on the night flyer and spoke focus more on uh, the Jimmy Olsen character. Um, but Stephen King and the director wanted $10 million from Hollywood Studios in 2000 and they would not shell that out. So the sequel never happened. So the other thing that I talked about that was kind of cool was the Night Flyer himself. So in this mythology, he can't be seen in mirrors, but he cracks mirrors when he comes by them. Um, so, you know, some mythologies are different. Like, True Blood, the vampires can totally be seen in mirrors. You know, that, that's just a myth that they protected themselves. But this one, they, they stuck true to that. Um, he's got long nails that are basically claws that he uses as weapons. His face is very deformed. He is very much a monster. Um, but he doesn't have two tiny Bella Lugosi fangs or anything. He's got... Um, Basically, he opens up his mouth to reveal himself at the end. He's got these two giant railroad spikes just in the center. Like his face, it doesn't unhinge like a snake, but it opens a lot wider. Kind of reminded me of a snake. And then just these two single fangs came out of the center. And he still had like a bunch of jagged teeth. Um, so that was very interesting. It was different. I'm not a big fan of vampires having just all like crazy jagged teeth most of the time. Um, and that possibly could be because I watched a lot of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I watched Underworld, and they just look more human, um, and you just have the two long fangs that either are there all the time or hidden, but it's just a personal preference. What do you think about how the Night Flyer looked? An, an, I think it's an interesting take on a vampire, but I mean, I'm with you, I don't really... I prefer the Bella Lugosi style vampires to the monsters anyway, so. Yeah, like, I mean, the, I, I like the thing in Buffy they did, really, they're like, if they were just walking around, it was, you know, they were normal, and then when they, I guess, were in fight mode or getting ready to eat or whatever, you know, they're, they'd get, like, the crunched up nose and the, the raised eyebrow, or eye, eyebrow, raised brow bones or what have you, but yeah, just the straight monster all the time. Or the jagged teeth all the time just doesn't do it for me. Now, they did have him, um, when he's walking away, like, you can see his human face. And he even looks at the girl reporter at the end through the through a window. And, you know, it's his regular face. But by this point, um, our normal main character um, is is dead. Um, yeah. He, um, the night flyer forced him to suck his blood and it basically it went black and white and he went into like a trance and thought all the people that the night flyer had killed had risen up and were vampires and trying to kill him so he grabs a fire axe and starts hacking them all to bits and then the cops show up and blow him away and that's really pretty much it um he gets made into the the night flyer Homegirl gets the front page, since that was a big thing, was him getting his front page, him getting his front page, him getting back on the front page. So he gets back on the front page, just not quite the way he anticipated. Yeah. So, uh, was there anything else that you, like any scenes or anything specific you wanted to talk over? Because there really wasn't a... That's what that's yeah, what I don't really think there was. I mean... I guess kind of the whole movie is kind of a supposed to be like a commentary on how reporters are so quote unquote bloodthirsty for their stories and all, but I don't think it did a really good job of getting that symbolism across. Yeah, it, because I mean, also the editor, uh, I guess, or the lead of the newspaper, or whatever, he, um, I guess I should say tabloid, uh, he pitted the two reporters against themselves or against each other to try to get this story and he was like i love this job and had like the big ominous laugh and then you never saw him again i was kind of hoping he would get his comeuppance and but that never happened so yeah. but but overall um this was mostly forgettable like it just wasn't yeah it's not a memorable movie in any way no i mean it's 
it, it's got a snappy title, and Miguel Ferrer did a good job in with what he was given. But other than that, there's not really anything to the movie. Yeah, so I'm not going to say that this is hot-ass trash like Lamageddon, but I definitely think I'm going to rate it as hot trash, just because it's not good enough to be only trash, but it, it, it's, it's just it's just kind of forgettable. Like, I'll probably... I don't have any desire ever to watch it again. I don't... It's not bad enough to where I should tell somebody, you know, like, hey, you should watch this movie. It's, you know, it's notoriously bad, like Manos or The Room or something of that nature. It, it's not bad enough to recommend on a so bad as a good level, and it's not good enough to recommend as a good movie. So I, I agree with the hot trash uh, rating. Yeah. So if you are curious and you decide that you want to watch this, um, I have not, between Letterboxd and Googling, I have not found anywhere that this movie is available to stream. We did actually watch it on a DVD, and the DVD is so old that it is in one of those old style, the, the back of it is plastic, there's a cardboard top that flips on it and a piece of plastic closes over the top of it. So it is an older DVD, I found it, it had to be on eBay. So I can't buy anything on Amazon because you'll know that I bought it. So yeah, it, it yeah. had to be at eBay. But and it's a fairly expensive DVD too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think it's pretty expensive, but I think I got that one actually. Like I found it on a deal. So there maybe maybe there's another release or something that was more expensive, but that wasn't crazy expensive from what I recall. But okay, I, I don't know. I don't remember my name half the time, so remembering something that I bought a year ago, <laughs> fair, <laughs> or you know, close to a year ago, I, I don't know. So much has happened since then. Yeah, that's true. So, well, that being said, um, that was our episode tonight. Thank you for joining us for episode three of Schlock Talk. Um, actually, Schlock Talk episode two dropped today, which will be about two weeks from now. But if you haven't uh, listened to that one um, while you're listening to this one, go back and check that one out. That is uh, on Lamageddon, and it's featuring uh, mine and Carl's good friend Jenna as my guest host. It's her first time podcasting, so it was very interesting to talk to her. And you can go back if you haven't and check out episode one where we talk about the movie Schlock. Um, I think next up, that I know we're going to do is a Thanksgiving special and a Christmas special, and there'll be some episodes in between that. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I'm also later tonight going to record for the Cinematic Underdogs, me and Justin, and we're going to do a sports movie countdown. So it's a little bit different than this show here. And I'm not sure when that'll drop. It'll probably be out. It's probably out by the time you're listening to this, but I don't know for sure. So if it, is go and check it out if it's not go be on the lookout and with that um thanks everybody y'all have a good day oh nope i almost forgot um if you like what you're listening to please do like and subscribe um if you would like to contact me justin carl um email the average joe's movie clubcast at gmail.com or go to our facebook page hit the big red button and it'll do it for you, or go on my letterbox um, and leave me comments, etc. We want to hear from you. We want your thoughts, questions, and suggestions. And with that, goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.